nothing but the truth. The current president, Ranil Vikramasinghe, who at one time was your compatriot, you all were together in a party, and he accused uh, you of running away from the battle. Yes, we ran away. We ran away from the rogues. <laughs> We ran away from the corrupted political system, corrupt political leaders, corrupt from top to bottom. Right now, we have what you may call economic Armageddon. Wow, that's a strong word, yes. An economic disruption, financial bankruptcy that has detrimentally impacted on the lives of all of the 22 million country that were bankrupted by the Rajapaksas, the country through corruption, kleptocracy, war scale um, looting. Hello, I'm Raj Chengapa of India Today and your host for Nothing But The Truth. In this episode, we will look at a critical upcoming election in Sri Lanka. The presidential election that is going to happen on September 21st. And if you recall, Sri Lanka went into an economic collapse two years ago. And even as I stand in this beach, which looks normal, uh, the ball face as it's called in Colombo, the trouble that we saw two years ago when there was an economic collapse, this place was occupied, this full of protesters, and there was a government collapse over there. The, both the Rajapaksa brothers had to resign. One was president of uh, Sri Lanka, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, and Mahinda Rajapaksa was prime minister. Both had to resign. And a government uh, headed by, a national government headed by Ranil Vikramasinghe as president, who was a single MP in this, uh, that to a nominated MP, he, he was made the president as a compromise. And he has been running the country. Now, there are, all over two dozen contenders that are there for the post. Uh, the front runner is Sachit Premadasa, who is from the SJB, who was the arch rival uh, to the SLPP, in fact, contested uh, the presidential elections in 2019 against Gotabaya and came second. He is now positioning himself and saying, I am the man for the day. I mean, for the task that is there uh, entrusted to me. Ranil Vikramasinghe is also standing as an independent. He is not being supported by the ruling SLPP, but uh, they have propped up Namal Rajapaksa uh, to contest the elections as president. And there is a th another front, the left front headed by the JVP, which has coalesced into the NPP. And they're also saying that this is, a, they have never been tested before as running a government. And they're saying this is their turn. To understand the complexity of this, I went across and spoke to Sajid Premadasa, who is the front runner according to polls, and listen into this interview because he gives his vision as to how he sees uh, this particular election. Why is it so critical? What are his uh, uh, his economic vision? Why should the Ranil Vikramasinghe group uh, be defeated? And what does he see in the days ahead, not only with Sri Lanka, but how he looks at India-Sri Lanka relations? So do listen to, this is an exclusive uh, interview where you get a clear picture of what Sajid Premadasa wants. Let's go and meet him. The office of the leader of the opposition, Sajid Premadasa, who is also president of the SJB. It is one of the leading parties and there is a very critical election coming up, the presidential election after Sri Lanka went into huge turmoil in 2022 that saw an economic collapse and this election will be another turning point in the island's history. The man at the forefront is Sajid Premadasa, leading the presidential polls according to uh, recent surveys. Sajid ji, what is the key issues you feel and why is this election so critical? Presently, Sri Lanka is governed by an administration that does not have a people's mandate. Mm -hmm. The very same majority in parliament which proposed illogical misunderstood economic policies, mm -hmm. Sri Lanka fell into 
the situation of economic bankruptcy. Right. The very same people who put Sri Lanka into this terrible situation, which devastated many lives, they themselves formed into a coalition to have a replacement. So what we have is a replacement president mm -hmm. elected by a group of parliamentarians who have lost their mandate. So it's very important that the people's voices are heard. Right. That the people themselves have an opportunity to elect their own leader not go through the same old facade of a selected leader. We need an elected leader. Right. The people's opinions and their expectations, their views will be properly represented in such a situation. So the first important thing is the necessity for a people's mandate. Right. Second, even though it's not in that kind of a pecking order, a similar importance has to be attached to bring Sri Lanka out mm -hmm. of this situation of economic catastrophe. Right now, we have what you may call economic Armageddon. Wow. That's a strong word, yeah. An economic disruption, financial bankruptcy that has detrimentally impacted on the lives of all of the 22 million living in our country. In order to extricate Sri Lanka out of this mess, we need a precise, concise, people-led, people supported program that is based on rationality, that is based on a proper comprehension of the political economy. And we need to have evidence-based decision-making processes deciding on policy. Excellent. The policy that we fervently believe is the middle of the road policy. Sri Lanka has gone through a lot, yeah. through extreme right-wing neoliberal economic policies um, that have basically made the rich richer and the poor poorer. Mm -hmm. We don't subscribe to that. Okay. It has also resulted in crony capitalism. Mm -hmm. And there is a kleptocracy that has been created. Uh, through this situation. On the other hand, we fully believe that the extreme left-wing socialistic way right. will also not provide results for the benefit of the country and the people. So it's the middle of the path road. Which you we, see yourself, the center. Yeah, that's what we believe in. That's mm -hmm. our ideology. Our principles are based on the social democratic premise, belief in the social market economy, right. where capitalism with a human face would be practiced to generate the wealth, the capital, the income right. that is needed for a country. But of course, we are always aware that capitalism in itself creates divisions. Right. Uh, it creates um, disparities. It creates a lot of pressure, harm uh, to the society itself. Right. So those have to be ameliorated by limited state intervention and the espousal of social democratic principles, which will champion social equity, social justice, a fair distribution, mm. or if I may say a fair redistribution of income, wealth and resources. So the situation of economic Armageddon 
can only be addressed through a rational economic policy which has the backing of the people. And mm. I'm happy to say all of this is inadequate unless the policy prescriptions that we espouse to become a reality on the ground. We have to have a very efficient, efficacious implementation system with rigorous monitoring, evaluation, right. feedback procedures in place so that we make sure the policy cycle that decides on these policy prescriptions are sound right. and are in good working order. I was listening to uh, the current president, Ranil Vikramasinghe, who at one time was your compatriot, you all were together in a party, and he accused uh, you uh, and of course uh, the other rival of running away from the battle when the crisis happened in October, uh, I mean in, in uh, 2022, uh, 2022. What is your views on that? He, he says, look, they're not responsible. They, they left the battle and, uh, you know, I, I saved the country. So the country that were bankrupted by the Rajapaksas, the country through corruption, kleptocracy, vast scale um, looting of the Sri Lankan people's resources. They were the very same people who are backing the president right now. Mm. This is why those who stole our assets, those who are responsible for achieving very high commissions, all those monies parked abroad, they have not been brought to book. Mm. So this is the quid pro quo mm. for supporting to come to high position. They are not brought to book. The stolen assets are not recovered. So I can tell you, very honest, yes, we ran away. We ran away from the rogues. <laughs> we ran away from the corrupted political system. Corrupt political leaders. Corrupt from top to bottom. I'm not surprised that Vikram Singh and Rajapaksa are very comfortable political bedfellows. Because I remember quite distinctly in 2015, when we came into power, our mandate was to catch thieves. Mm -hmm. But under the present president's guidance, he was the then prime minister at that time, we came with a mandate to ensure that corruption is eradicated. But what happened? The then president and the prime minister encouraged cozy relationships mm -hmm. with the very same people who were corrupt, which is one of the reasons why we were rejected way back in 2019, because we didn't implement the mandate. But you stood for the presidential election at that time and uh, you came second. What makes you think that this time the people are going to be with you because you did lose by I think a 7% margin or 8% margin. What makes you think that this time you are the person that can lead Sri, La Sri Lanka out of this? What is your vision uh, in that front and why you think you're the best for the job? It's quite simple. We have the best policies. We have the best decision-making structures. We have the best team. And we are doers. Hmm. We walk the talk. And he says... Uh, President uh, Vikramasinghe says that he's got, I think he counted yesterday, 37 parties. And they have this new pact that is uh, there where he says that we will lead the country out. And he says it's really stability. And if 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 uh, we don't proceed with what is there right now, they will go back to the chaos of 2022. So the whole battle is uh, he will provide a stable government. You will not. Well, he has provided stability in two different ways to two different sectors. Yes, I agree. He has provided extreme stability to the Rajapaksas. 
he has provided excellent stability to himself and the crooks and cronies who surround himself. I agree that stability is there. But for the 22 million people, what has been achieved? Their lives have become smaller. Mm. Their economy has become constrained, contracted. Their investment needs, savings needs, uh, consumption needs, production needs, export needs have been brought down. So the stability he's talking about has come at an extreme cost. Mm -hmm. The cost is massive losses of standard of living. Mm. Nearly half of Sri Lanka mm -hmm. is poor. They suffer from consumption poverty. They suffer from food poverty. They suffer from investment poverty. They suffer from loss of livelihood. They don't eat three square meals a day. Of course, I'm not surprised that those who are talking about taking responsibility and bringing stability, that they feel that everything is okay. That's because they are closeted. They are living in mansions. They are living in palaces. We are at the ground level. Mm. We know the whims and fancies, the voice of the people, the thinking of the people, their aspirations, their expectations. He could so, as well. there yeah, is a huge disparity between those who are in the governance process and the people. There is a complete uh, mismatch. Wow. So, the rulers, they are living in cloud cuckoo land. <laughs> 22 million people right. who they have their feet on the ground are going through misery. Whether it's agriculture, right. fisheries, businesses, micro, small and medium sized industries. Close to 300,000 micro, small and medium sized enterprises have closed down. Millions have been unemployed. Enterprises have been closed. That's stability? <laughs> Certainly not stability. <laughs> this particular incompetent administration is sowing the seeds of future social unrest. So the president should understand this famous phrase, if the few who are rich in society, if they are unable to take care of the many who are poor, the system will crumble. This the president has forgotten. He claims that uh, he came at a time when there was economic disaster, which he was not responsible for. He stabilized the economy. He was able to get uh, funding and assistance from other countries. And one of the things that he's doing is that he, he, as an example, he gives the gas, cooking gas prices, where he says uh, was ruling around 4,900 or so. He's brought that down to 3,200, uh, around that much, whatever the current amount is. And he's and that's one of the reasons he's using uh, as his symbol, the gas cylinder. So his thing is, and he's also given, if you notice the public sector employees, he's, ready, uh, he's increased their salaries, he's been giving, giving relief or land deeds, he says to various people that's there. So in his opinion, he, see, he, he claims that he has, you know, brought the stability and a, a reassurance back to the people. One wonders how long lasting these election gimmicks will be. Mm -hmm. Because he doesn't understand people-based economics. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is that today there is rampant corruption. Rampant corruption dictated by a dictatorial regime, mm -hmm. unelected regime, illegitimate regime. 
they lack legitimacy because they were chosen by the very same people who bankrupted them. How can he say he's not responsible for bankruptcy when all along his life he has been backing the Rajapaksas? Hmm. Even when he was in government, he was backing the Rajapaksas. During my presidential election, he was backing the Rajapaksas. Right. So, President Gotabe Rajapaksa must be ever so grateful <laughs> to Honorable Ranil Vikram Singh for creating enough internal dissension within my election campaign in 2009, which paved the way for uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa to go to the position of presidency in a highway, in a freeway. Mm without any <laughs> obstacles. So he is connected to this particular administration which bankrupted the country. And he talks of not taking responsibility. He had the opportunity of coming into parliament because his numbers came so down he was left with a nationalist seat. <laughs> so after the 2020 general election, how long did it take for him to come into parliament? Mm. He is the one who stayed away from parliament. He should have come into parliament and provided the country with the requisite prescriptions and without what? going after the uh, astrologers and finding the most appropriate and propitious time <laughs> for him to enter parliament. He should have uh, come to parliament and made his contribution. We were the people who objected to the then government giving humongous tax cuts, 600 to 700 billion rupees in tax cuts, which reduced state revenue from 12% of GDP to 8%. Where was he? Hmm. Why was he keeping his mouth shut? He was nowhere. We were the people who said IMF support is essential and important. But Gotabe Rajapaksa decided, no, we don't even need the last tranche. This is as soon as he right. came into power. Lo and behold, within two to two and a half years, they all had to go with a begging bowl. So, when this argument is made that he took over the responsibility of running the country, one must understand by increasing suffering on the people, by limiting the people's choices, by squeezing their incomes and purposely creating an unbearable new normal for the people. Right. Of course, you'll have stability <laughs> in the short term. But do remember, this so-called stability that he's talking about is a ticking time bomb. In terms of the economic crisis that uh, Sri Lanka faces, what is the vision that you have? How will you pull it out of this crisis? What is the game plan that you have? Because you do have the IMF funding and there's a repayment pro problem that's going to come and you had the grace period that's going to get over and you're going to have fresh pressure on your resources. What are you planning to do in terms of, you've studied at the London School of Economics, you specialize in it. What is your economic vision for Sri Lanka? Well, it's not just myself, myself and my economics team. And we have uh, an excellent uh, group of experts, specialists in a variety of fields, including the economy. Well, the simple mantra is grow, grow, grow. Hmm. Export, export, export. Gain as much FDI, FDI, FDI. <laughs> That's the mantra. That will alleviate poverty. Mm -hmm. That will generate growth. Mm -hmm. That will create employment. That will enhance livelihoods. People have, will have money in their hands. They will consume. They will invest. They will produce. They will save. They will export. So the, the society will be a hive right. of economic activity. 
we can't have a static economy, an economy that is sluggish right. and moving at tortoise pace. While at the same time, we must speak with our international partners to arrive at a much more reasonable package, which the silent majority of the people in this country can afford and bear up. We can't think of the minuscule in our country who are the super rich and decide public policy mm. and decide economic policy. Save the rich, punish the rest. That will not be our policy. Coming to the fact that you're looking at expanding the economy and let us look at foreign policy. Um, India has come with an initiative recently with uh, economic initiatives for connectivity. How do you see relations with India? And also there is always China at uh, around with it. How would you handle these uh, competing interests? Well, we as a country should engage with all of the countries that provide us with competitive advantages and competitive advantages. Mm. That's a simple mantra. But in our relations, we must duly recognize the importance of our relationship with India, mm -hmm. its proximity, our strategic location, India's assets. These resources can be mobilized and garnered in such a manner that relationships ultimately result in mutual benefit. Foreign policy should be dictated by achieving objectives which are directly correlated to national interest right. in a time-specific manner. We will have a very scientific approach, fact-based, data-based approach to ensure that our external relationships are established in such a manner which would provide the maximum advantage to our motherland and to its people. Indeed, yeah. in, in lieu of that, right. we will establish cordial relationships with all of the countries. And those relationships should accrue benefit to our country. We have had historical links, cultural links with India. And I must say our relationship is somewhat special. And the special relationship with India has to be prioritized and protected. In the same way, we have to work with other countries. Right, including China. Yes, that's a given. And we will work with all the rest of the countries, the various um, multilateral blocks, political uh, blocks, trading blocks, in whichever possible manner, with a view to advancing our national interest. Your late father, who was president of Sri Lanka, uh, Mr. Premadasa, uh, had reservations about the IPKF and there were a lot of issues when he was president with India. How do you see that period and uh, you know, how different are you in your, in, in your father's approach towards India? I think it's very important how throughout the years and decades the contextual situation has changed right. drastically. The environment and the context uh, in the 80s, 90s decades right. are so much different to the challenges that we face in 2024. Fair enough. I think Sri Lanka's positive, strong relationship, the historical relationship, and the sentimental relationship, the collegiality, should be um, one of the major reasons for closer relations, for closer integration, economic, trade, commercial, business. It will allow Sri Lankan products access 
to the biggest market in the world, right. the most populous country today in the world. Right. So that's a wonderful opportunity. We must use that opportunity, utilize that opportunity, exploit that opportunity to ensure that Sri Lanka has gains in trade, businesses, commerce, and in the uh, enterprising se enterprise entrepreneurial sector as a whole. And yeah. the close bilateral relationships will also accrue a, a variety of assistance programs. What was the singular country that provided us with the biggest support uh, when Sri Lanka was in crisis? Single country it was India. We appreciate that. And when we were in trouble, the Indian government and the Indian people came to our help. And it is very important, business, commercial, political, trade, investment, so on and so forth. So we consider India as a great opportunity, a strong relationship as an opportunity and as a springboard right. for Sri Lanka to jumpstart our fast track movement to economic growth. And with that note, Sajid Pandadasa, we wish you all the very best in the upcoming elections. Let the best man win, as they say. Thank, Thank you sir. very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So there you have it. You heard Sajid Premadasa, the front runner uh, for the Sri Lankan presidential elections. Uh, he outlined his vision as to why he should be the man for the job. Uh, of course, there are other contenders. There's Ranil Vikramasinghe, who puts an equally convincing case as to why he should be uh, continue to be president. There is also the left parties, the JVP, that says they should be given a shot at it. And there are another two dozen others who say that they are the, the people for the job. But Sajid Premadasa gives you the sense of what the big battle is. And this is something we will all watch closely. Thank you for listening to this episode of Nothing But The Truth. I look forward to having you with me next week. Nothing But The Truth.